a mixed bag of topics this week. I hope you enjoy watching this video as much as I did in making it. Without further ado, let's get into it. And we'll keep it simple, nothing complicated. After reading some recent questions posted on the internet, I thought it would be good to answer some of these for you. They included questions like, Why is the neutral a live wire? I thought the brown wire was live. What is the speed of electricity? Can it really be the speed of light? How does electricity work? And why do we have a neutral current? There shouldn't be any current in the neutral, surely. Let's begin by answering the question, what is electricity? And this is something that many scientists are still arguing about, so I'm going to stick with the popular theory of what happens in a piece of wire. It's helped me to understand electricity all those years ago, and it still does today. This is the usual representation of a copper atom. There is a nucleus surrounded by many electrons. The electrons orbit around the nucleus in predefined groups or shells, each shell being a little further out from the nucleus. The shell is at its most stable when it is full. The first shell has just two electrons in it. The second shell requires eight electrons to be full, and the third shell is complete with 18 electrons. What about the fourth shell? For copper, this has only one electron, and this electron is only loosely attached to the nucleus. It can detach itself and move to another nucleus. This single and outermost electron is called a valence electron, and all the copper atoms will have valence electrons that randomly move between other atoms. They form an electron cloud, some going left, some going right, some this way, and some that way, just like a crowded shopping mall at the weekend, full of people all going different ways with no urgency. The makeup of the nucleus, plus the number of electrons, is what makes this a copper atom. Silver is also a good conductor of electricity, but will have a different structure to the nucleus and a different number of electrons orbiting around it. Silicon is a semiconductor and will be different again, and more on this in another video. The orbits of the electrons are overlapping with each other. The atoms are tightly packed, so it is easy for these loose valence electrons to move between atoms. If we apply a voltage to the copper material, we can cause this cloud of electrons to move in just one direction. Here, all the electrons will move to the left. Think of the crowded shopping mall. A fire at one end will cause all the shoppers to move in the same direction towards the fire exit. In this sketch, imagine that we've applied a voltage to the copper wire. Starting at A in the top drawing, a valence electron, shown in red, moves to the left and leaves behind a hole, shown in blue. This hole means that there is a space for another valence electron to move into it. This is B in the middle drawing, and it also leaves a hole. In the bottom drawing at C, an electron jumps to fill the hole in B and creates a hole in C. And so it continues, electrons moving to the left and holes moving to the right. This is where you may have heard engineers asking the question, are we talking about electron theory or about hole theory when looking at electronic circuits? Me, personally, I'm a hole theory person, but more on that in another video. This sketch shows the lattice-like structure of copper or any conducting material. The nucleus of the atom is fixed in place within the lattice. Only the electrons are free to move. Nichrome is a good conducting material with a high resistance and is often used in the manufacture of heating elements, kettle elements and so on. When we apply a voltage to the material, copper, nichrome or whatever, electrons will flow in the same direction as we mentioned earlier. As electrons are pushed through the material lattice by the voltage, they will collide with the atoms of the material and this will cause the lattice to heat up 
as it absorbs the kinetic energy or movement energy of the electrons being forced through the lattice. The heat is a byproduct of the electron collisions and it is the heat that we need to boil the water. How fast do electrons go? My lights come on instantly, so is electricity instant. Does it really travel at the speed of light? Electrons actually move very slowly, only a few millimetres a second. You can run faster than electrons. So, why is electricity instantaneous at almost the speed of light? By way of explanation, imagine this. We have a pipe with a long piece of wood passing all the way through. The wood is stiff and inflexible. Let the pipe be the copper wire and the long piece of wood can be the electrons spread throughout the wire. Let the pipe be 200 metres long and we can call the left side end A and the right end we can call end B. If the wood is moved just 5 millimetres at point A, what happens at point B 200 metres away? The piece of wood instantly moves 5 millimetres from point B to point C. The effect of moving just 5 millimetres at point A is felt instantly at point B, the furthest end, 200 metres away, even though the wood only moved 5 millimetres. This is what happens when electrons move. Let's switch a light on and the electrons all move together. If the electrons move at the consumer unit, then they will instantly move at the light. They move as a body, as a flow. We say that the effects of electricity are felt at almost the speed of light, almost 300,000 kilometres per second, or, if you prefer it in miles, then 186,000 miles per second. All the molecules and fibres that made up the length of wood moved at the same time. They didn't travel at the speed of light, but the effect of their movement was felt instantly. And just like the piece of wood, all the electrons in a length of copper wire move at the same time too. Just like the pipe above, the copper lattice that makes up the copper wire does not move. It is just the electrons that move, millions of them, slowly. Electrons may move slowly, but the effect, what we call electricity, moves at almost the speed of light. That is why the light comes on the instant the switch is turned on. Another question that is often asked, why do we have a neutral current? We all know that neutral is zero volts, just like the earth terminal, don't we? Let's look at current flow in a simple resistor circuit. Shown here is a DC circuit, but similar rules could be applied to an AC circuit. The voltage forces the current, the flow of electrons, around the circuit. As the electrons pass through the resistance, they will cause the resistor to heat up. If this was an incandescent lamp, the filament in the lamp would heat up and glow white hot, so hot that photons of light would be released into the room. If this was a kettle element, the water would boil. But the circuit must be continuous for current to flow, which means that current must flow along all the conductors, including the neutral. Break the circuit anywhere and current flow stops. No continuity means no electron flow. The lights go out, the kettle goes cold. We have a saying, if the electrons can't get back ohm, then they won't leave ohm in the first place. Perhaps a central heating analogy might help your understanding. The same water goes round and round the central heating system. The water is heated, circulated along the hot water pipe, and then gives up the energy as heat at the radiator. The cooler water that has given up its heat in the radiator returns to the boiler along the return pipe. At the boiler, the water is reheated and repeats the process of being pumped around. Without the return pipe, water cannot flow through the system. Stop the flow of water and the radiators go cold. If we compare the central heating to what happens with electrics, what do we have? The boiler 
is comparable to the electrical supply transformer. It's what gives the electrons movement energy, called kinetic energy, and causes them to move around the circuit. The hot water pipe can be our equivalent to the electrical line conductor, and the return pipe is the neutral conductor in electrical terms. A kettle, a load, could be compared to the radiator. It's the place where all the action is happening. It's where the radiator becomes warm. It's where the water is boiled for that well-deserved mug of coffee. A voltage is created, the switch is on, so we have continuity. The electrons will flow along the line conductor to the kettle and through the kettle heating element. As the electrons are pushed through the kettle element, the kinetic movement energy from electron movement and collisions will heat the water. The electrons leave the kettle on the neutral conductor and return to the transformer. The electrons are then pushed around the circuit, again and again, until the water boils and the kettle disconnects itself, at which point, with the circuit broken, the current stops flowing and the kettle stops boiling. Let's do a little number crunching now and see what is happening in the circuit and why we have a neutral current. The resistance of the circuit is made up of the load resistance and the cable resistances. As this is an AC circuit, we should really call the resistance an impedance, but we'll stick with resistance for now. This is a 3 kilowatt kettle, 3000 watts, with a heater resistance of 19.2 ohms. This is fixed and won't change. The line conductor and the neutral conductor each have 0 0.2 ohms of resistance. The 240 volt supply voltage is shared between the cables and the kettle in a ratio according to their resistances. This means that the kettle has most of the voltage, 235 volts, and is why the water becomes hot and not the cables. Because the voltage across the kettle is not the full 240 volts, the power is a little less. With 12 and a quarter amps flowing, the power in the kettle is 2.88 kilowatts, a hardly noticeable change. Look at the bottom of the kettle. The voltage at that point is 2.5 volts. There's a small voltage there to drive the electrons through the neutral cable. There must be current flow in the neutral wire, which means there must be a voltage difference between the two ends of the neutral to drive the current. Measured at the kettle end, it is 2.5 volts. Measured nearer to the earth, it is less, moving closer to zero volts at the earth terminal. And lastly, for this video, what is a live conductor? Because line and neutral both carry current, they are called live conductors. They are both current carrying conductors in normal fault free conditions. Line is a live conductor, neutral is a live conductor. In some countries, the line conductor is called the hot wire. Think of it this way. In a UK three pin plug, there are two live conductors plus an earth but don't get them the wrong way round. Thank you for watching. I hope that you found this video informative and interesting and perhaps cleared up some grey areas for you, or maybe even generated some more questions. Let me know. Please subscribe to our channel and remember to click on notify and don't forget, you can also type in Learn Electrics into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer or smart device. We are always adding new videos to our channel, so don't miss the next one. And once again, thank you for watching, and we hope to see you again very soon.